a victorious attitude. Go boldly, go serenely, go augustly. Who can withstand thee then? Browning. What a grasp the mind would have if we could always hold a victorious attitude toward everything. Sweeping past obstacles and reaching out into the energy of the universe, it would gather to itself material for building a life in its own image. To be a conqueror in appearance, in one's bearing, is the first step toward success. It inspires confidence in others as well as in oneself. Walk, talk, and act as though you were a somebody, and you are more likely to become such. Move about among your fellow men as though you believe you are a man of importance. Let victory speak from your face and express itself in your manner. Carry yourself like one who is conscious he has a splendid mission, a grand aim in life. Radiate a hopeful, expectant, cheerful atmosphere. In other words, be a good advertisement of the winner you are trying to be. Doubts, fears, despondency, lack of confidence will not only give you a way in the estimation of others and brand you as a weakling, a probable failure, but they will react upon your mentality and destroy your self-confidence, your initiative, your efficiency. They are telltales proclaiming to everyone you meet that you are losing out in the game of life. A triumphant expression inspires trust, makes a favorable impression. A despondent, discouraged impression creates distrust, makes an unfavorable impression. If you don't look cheerful and appear and act like a winner, nobody will want you. Every man will turn a deaf ear to your plea for work. No matter if you are jobless and have been out of work for a long time, you must keep up a winning appearance, a victorious attitude, or you will lose the very thing you are after. The world has little use for whiners or long-faced failures. It is difficult to get very far away from people's estimate of us. A bad first impression often creates a prejudice that is impossible afterwards wholly to remove. Hence the importance of always radiating a cheerful, uplifting atmosphere, an atmosphere that will be a commendation instead of a condemnation. Not that we should deceive by trying to appear what we are not, but we should always keep our best side out, not our second best or our worst. Our personal appearance is our show window where we insert what we have for sale, and we are judged by what we put there. The victorious idea of life, not its failure side, its disappointed side, the triumph, not the thwarted ambition side, is the thing to keep ever uppermost in the mind, for it is this that will lead you to the light. You must give the impression that you are a success, or that you have qualities that will make you successful, that you are making good, or no recommendation or testimonial, however strong, will counteract the unfavorable impression you make. So much of our progress in life depends upon our reputation, upon making a favorable impression upon others, that it is of the utmost importance to cultivate mental forcefulness. It is the mind that colors the personality, gives it its tone and character. If we cultivate willpower, decision, positive instead of negative thinking, we cannot help making an impression of masterfulness, and everybody knows that this is the qualification that does things. It is masterfulness, force, that achieves results. And if we do not express it in our appearance, people will not have confidence in our achieving ability. They may think that we can sell goods behind a counter, work under orders, carry out some mechanical routine with faithfulness and precision. But they will not think we are fitted for leadership, that we can command resources to meet possible crisis or big emergencies. Never say or do anything which will show the earmarks of a weakling of a nobody, of a failure. Never permit yourself to assume a poverty-stricken attitude. Never show the world a gloomy, pessimistic face, which is an admission that life has been a disappointment to you instead of a glorious triumph. Never admit by your speech, your appearance, your gait, your manner, that there is anything wrong with you. Hold up your head. Walk erect. Look everybody in the face. No matter how poor you may be or how shabby your clothes, whether you are jobless, homeless, friendless even, show the world that you respect yourself, that you believe in yourself, and that no matter how hard the way, you are marching on to victory. Show by your expression that you can think and plan for yourself, that you have a forceful mentality. 
the victorious triumph attitude will put you in command of resources which a timid, self-depreciating failure attitude will drive from you. This was well illustrated by a visitor to the Athenium Library in Boston. Ignorant of the fact that members only were entitled to his special privileges, this visitor entered the place with a confident bearing, seated herself in a comfortable window seat, and spent a delightful morning reading and writing letters. In the evening she called on a friend, and in the course of conversation referred to her morning at the Athenium. "'Why, I didn't know you were a member,' exclaimed the friend. "'A member?' "'No,' said the lady. "'I am not a member. But what difference does that make?' The friend, who held an Athenium card of membership, smiled and replied, "'Only this, that none but the members are supposed to enjoy the privileges of which you availed yourself this morning.' Our manner and our appearance are determined by our mental outlook. If we see only failure ahead, we will act and look like failures. We have already failed. If we expect success, see it waiting for us a little bit up the road, we will act and look like successes. We have already succeeded. The failure attitude loses. The victorious attitude wins. Had the lady in Boston had any doubt to her right to enter the Athenium and freely use all its conveniences, her manner would have betrayed it. The library attendants would have noticed it at once and have asked her to show her card of membership, but her assured air gave the impression that she was a member. Her victorious attitude dominated the situation and put her in command of resources which otherwise she could not have controlled. The spirit in which you face your work in which you grapple with the difficulty, the spirit in which you meet your problem, whether you approach it like a conqueror with courage, a vigorous resolution and firmness, or with timidity, doubt, fear, will determine whether your career will be one grand victory or a complete failure. It is a great thing so to carry yourself wherever you go that when people see you coming, they will say to themselves, Here comes a winner. Here comes a man who dominates everything he touches. Thinking of yourself as habitually lucky will tend to make you so, just as thinking of yourself as habitually unlucky and always talking about your failures and your cruel fate will tend to make you unlucky. The attitude of mind which your thoughts and convictions produce is a real force which builds or tears down. The habit of always seeing yourself as a fortunate individual, the feeling grateful for just being alive, for being allowed to live on this beautiful earth and to have a chance to make good, will put your mind in a creative, producing attitude. We should all go through life as though we were sent here with a sublime mission to lift, to help, to boost, and not to depress and discourage, and so discredit the plan of the Creator. Our conduct should show that we are on this earth to play a magnificent part in life's drama, to make a splendid contribution to humanity. The majority of people seem to take it for granted that life is a great gambling game in which the odds are heavily against them. This conviction colors their whole attitude and is responsible for innumerable failures. In the betting machines used by horse racing gamblers, the bettors make the odds. If, for example, 500 persons bet on a certain horse and 100 bet on another, then the first horse automatically becomes a 5 to 1 choice and the odds in favor of his winning are five to one. In the game of life, most of us start out by putting the odds on our failure. In horse race gambling, the judgment that forms the basis of belief as to the winning horse has a comparatively secure foundation in a knowledge of the qualifications of the different racers. In life gambling, it is merely the supported opinion or viewpoint of the individual that puts the odds against himself. The majority of people look on the probability of their winning out in the life game in any distinctive way as highly improbable. When they look around and see how comparatively few of the multitudes of men and women in the world are winning, they say to themselves, Why should I think that I have a greater percentage of chance in my favor than others about me? These people have as much ability as I have, perhaps more, and they can do no more than grub along from hand to mouth. Of what use is it for me to struggle against fate? When people believe and figure they cannot, and therefore never will, be successes, and conduct themselves according to their conviction, when they take their places in life, not as probable winners, but as probable losers, 
is it any wonder that the odds are heavily against them? Mad, insane, eccentric, we say, when some miserable recluse dies in squalor and wretchedness. Starved, the coroner's inquest finds, although bank books revealing large deposits or else hoards of gold are discovered hidden away in nooks and crannies of the wretched miser's quarters. Are such persons whom we call mad, insane, eccentric, who stint and save and hoard in the midst of plenty, refusing even to buy food to keep them alive, any worse than those who face life in a poverty-stricken, failure attitude, refusing to see and enjoy the riches, the glories all around them? Is it any wonder that life is a disappointment to them? Is it any wonder that they see only what they look for, get only what they expect? Now, if you are trying to be successful, you must act like a successful person. Carry yourself like one. Talk, act, and think like a winner. You must radiate victory wherever you go. You must maintain your attitude by believing in the thing you are trying to do. If you persist in looking and acting like a failure, or a very mediocre or doubtless success, if you keep telling everybody how unlucky you are, and that you do not believe you will win out because success is only for a few, that the great majority of people must be hewers of wood and drawers of water, you will be about as much of a success as the actor who attempts to personate a certain type of character while looking, thinking, and acting exactly like its opposite. By a psychological law, we attract that which corresponds with our mental attitude, with our faith, our hopes, our expectations, or with our doubts and fears. If this were fully understood and used as a working principle in life, we would have no poverty, no failures, no criminals no down and outs. We would not see people everywhere with the expressions which indicate that there is very little enjoyment in living, that it is a serious question with them whether life is really worthwhile, whether it really pays to struggle on a miserable world where rewards are so few and uncertain, and pains and penalties so numerous and so certain. Every boy, every girl should be taught to assume the victorious attitude toward life, all through a youth's education, the idea should be drilled into him that he is intended to be a winner in life, that he is himself a prince, a god in the making. From his cradle up he should be taught to hold his head high, and to look on himself as a son of the king of kings, destined for great things. No child is properly reared and educated until he or she knows how to lead a victorious life. This is what true education means, victory over self, victory over conditions. It always pains me to hear a youth who ought to be full of hope and high promise express a doubt as to his future career. To hear him talk about his possible failure sounds like treason to his creator. Why youth itself is victory. Youth is a great prophecy, the forerunner of a superb fulfillment. A young man or a young woman talking about failure is like beauty talking about ugliness like superb health dwelling upon weakness and disease, like perfection dwelling upon imperfection. Youth means victory, because everything in the life of the healthy boy or girl is looking upward. There is no downgrade in normal youth. It is its nature to climb, to look up. Its very atmosphere should breathe hope, superb promise of the future. If all children were reared with such a triumphant conception of life, with such an unshakable belief in their heritage from God that nothing could discourage them, we would hear no talk of failure. We would soon sight the millennium. If they were made to understand that there is only one failure to be feared, failure to make good, the failure of character, the failure to keep growing, to a noble and enrich one's life, this world would be a paradise. Just think what would happen if all the down and outs today all of the people who look down upon themselves as failures or as dwarfs of what they ought to be could only get this victorious, this triumphant idea of life if they could only once glimpse their own possibilities and assume the triumphant attitude. They would never again be satisfied to grovel if they once got a glimpse of their divinity, once saw themselves in the sublime robes of their power, they never again would be satisfied with the rags of their poverty. But instead of trying to improve their condition, to get away from their failure, poverty-stricken atmosphere, 
they cling more closely to it and sink deeper and deeper in the quagmire of their own making. Everywhere we find whining, miserable people grumbling at everything, complaining that life is not worth living, that the game is not worth the candle, that life is a cheat, a losing game. Life is not a losing game. It is always victorious when properly played. It is the players who are at fault. The great trouble with all failures is that they were not started right. It was not drilled into the very texture of their being in youth that what they would get out of life must be created mentally first, and that inside the man, inside the woman, is where the great creative process of life are carried on. That which man does with his hands is secondary. It is what he does with his brain that counts. That is what starts things going. Some of us never learn how to create with our minds. We depend too much upon creating with our hands or on other people to help us. We depend too much on the things outside of us when the mainspring of life, the power that moves the world of men and things, is inside of us. There are times when we cannot see the way ahead, when we seem to be completely enveloped in the fogs of discouragement, disappointment, and failure of our plans. But we can always do the thing that means salvation for us, that is persistently, determinedly, everlastingly to face towards our goal, whether we can see it or not. This is our only chance of overcoming our difficulties. If we turn about face, turn our back on our goal, we are headed toward disaster. No matter how many obstacles may block your path or how dark the way, if you look up, think up, and struggle up, you can't help succeeding. Whatever you do for a living, whatever fortune or misfortune may come to you, hold the victorious attitude and push ahead. A captain might as well turn about his ship when he strikes a fog bank because he cannot see the way ahead of him and still expect to make his distant harbor as for you to drop your victorious attitude and face the other way just because you have run into a fog bank of disappointment or failure. The only hope of the captain's reaching his destination is in being true to the compass that guides him in the fog and darkness as well as in the light. He may not see the way, but he can follow his compass. That we can also do by holding the victorious attitude towards life, the only attitude that can ensure safety and bring us into port.